Hey guys, coming to you again with the infamous bed work table thing. When you don't have much space, you gotta do with what you gotta do. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about a interesting computer. Uh, I find it very interesting. Um, this computer is by BSR. If you can't see it because it's a shitty camera. Um, that's BSR, that's Birmingham Sound Reproducers. Now, if you've never heard of them, uh, I never heard of them either before I picked up this computer uh, randomly at a swap meet. Uh, apparently they were kind of a big name in music, uh, especially in like the 70s and 60s. They started in the 50s. Um, I believe they went bankrupt in 98. Uh, they started out making turntables and stuff. So if you're into music, uh, especially maybe during the 70s, if you're really into music and stuff, you may have heard of these guys. Um, I never heard of them until uh, picking this thing up. Uh, like a lot of companies uh, that really maybe didn't have anything to do with computers uh, in the 80s and early 90s, they, you know, a lot of those companies just wanted a piece of the personal computer market, and uh, this is the machine that they came out with, or at least they uh, branded it uh, BSR. So this is the BSR 386SX16. Um, if you couldn't figure it out from the label, this is a machine with a 386SX processor running at 16 megahertz and uh, when I open this guy I, I will get into talking about that processor. Um, this is a really interesting machine and you'll I'll show you why I think it's very interesting. Uh, just looking at it, it kind of seems like just a you know, it's your run-of-the-mill clone 386 system but uh, really interesting design choices on this machine especially when we get to the motherboard it it's almost like they didn't do anything wrong with this thing but it's just different it's like they said they looked at it and they're like huh how does everyone else implement this well let's let's do it the opposite way it's just or let's just do it weirdly um and not even necessarily like proprietary stuff just like implemented weirdly um <laughs> you'll see um so, uh, yeah, starting off, let me just show you this thing here. Kind of nice case. There's kind of slim line there. Uh, just got your power button right on the front. Uh, turbo, the turbo is activated with a key. Uh, there's not a physical turbo button. Um, I believe it's like control, alt, and then plus and minus. Um, that's on the blog. I, I have that written uh, how it is on the blog if you want to find out about this. Not a lot of information on this computer on the internet. Uh, not a lot at all. I really only found one other entry about it and it was on the uh, vintage computer forums and actually the guy had pictures of his motherboard and they look different than the motherboard in this a little bit so probably different revisions. Um, down at the bottom we have a nice little red uh, reset switch. Uh, PS2 keyboard uh, port on the front. A little bit different. I mean, it wasn't unheard of to have these on the front, um, but usually they're on the back. So that's the first little hint of it's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have a PS2 port on a, a 386. Uh, a lot of these were still using AT uh, connectors. So that's kind of cool. Um, not a lot of room for expandability. Uh, at all. We only have these two uh, five and a quarter inch bays and I uh, kind of went historical with this one here at least for the moment. We have a 1.2 megabyte uh, floppy drive acting as our A drive on top and then on the bottom using that little adapter for the larger bay I have a 1.44 megabyte uh, floppy drive. So let's take a look at the back of this thing where there's it's just a little different. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, at first it doesn't seem different at all. So, what do we have here? Standard power supply. I think actually when I got this thing, the power supply is dead, so I swapped it out. Just a standard AT power supply. Um, not bad for expansion on the back. A uh, decent amount of ports. Those two are built in, even though it kind of looks like they're on an I/O card. Those are actually built in. Uh, that is a. I think that's just a Sound Blaster 16. I. Uh, put in, or maybe it's a Sound Blaster 2.0 Pro. I think it's probably a Pro. Um, a lot of my machines, especially my 386s, I always put a Pro in. It's not the same card, believe it or not. I don't have one or two cards that I keep putting in different computers. I actually have a lot of Sound Blaster Pros. Now there's the VGA. The VGA on this thing is extremely interesting, and we're going to talk about that. 
Also, that looks like an ISA or some kind of expansion card. That's built-in video, um, even though it kind of looks. It looks a little bit different, but at glance, you'd think that's an expansion port. Um, or not an expansion port, like a, an add-on card, but it's not. It's built-in video. And then here we have a uh, parallel port and another little port. Now, at a glance, you might think this is a PS2 mouse port, but it's not. This is a bus mouse port. Um, now, that might not be too... From if you're into these vintage computers, that's... You probably know what that is, but if not, uh, bus mouse, it, it was just a different interface for mice uh, back in like the late 80s, 90s. I think uh, Microsoft uh, started it out. Um, let me, I'll show you an example here. It, they, they pretty much are the same size, but the pins are different. So this is a PS2. Let me see if I can get it to focus. Probably not. Anyways, you probably can't see that too well, but there's like one, two, three, four, five, there's six pins and then there's like one in the middle that's not really a pin, it's like a plastic piece. So that's PS2. Now, here is a bus mouse and it pretty much looks the same. Uh, there's really nothing special about it, it just, just looks like any other mouse from the era. Again. Here's the thing, looks like a PS2, but if you actually look at it, the pins are arranged completely different from PS2. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there's like nine pins and other thing. But yeah, this this is a bus mouse. Um, I don't see them too often in the wild. Actually, I've never seen one in the wild, but that's probably just because I thought they were PS2 mice and I didn't bother to check. Um, but you can still get them pretty cheaply, places like eBay. Again, there's nothing special about them. They don't work any worse or better, I think. It's just a different uh, kind of interface. So, um, so that's a, that's a weird thing because uh, of all the computers, I mean, I wouldn't say bus mice or bus mouse ports are rare or anything like that, but I, I usually do not just see them built in. Um, sometimes they come on a lot like ATI, ATI older, their graphics card would have a bus mouse port, but um, also, there's another thing. Now, even though they look the same, I believe they use different protocols. And the most common one is, I think it's Microsoft, like, Endpoint or something like that. Um, and the other type is Logitech. So, can you guess which one this one uses? Actually, it just uses the standard uh, Microsoft or Intel, whoever came up with it. It doesn't use the Logitech one. But <laughs> you might think it... At first, I swore it would because this thing was so weird and they did things so differently. I could have, I probably was like, I bet they went with a stupid Logitech. It's, it's like a really rare sort of uh, implementation of it, but no, it's, it's just the standard one. Um, so drivers for it are pretty easy to find. All right, so with that out of the way, I guess we're going to uh, open this guy up, and it opens up, um, just screws on the side. You see that? That's just my hard drive parameters. Uh, I usually just always write them on a paper and stick it on because CMOS battery dies and you have to set up the hard drive manually. I like to have the information right there on the outside so I don't have to open it up. Um, so let's take a look at this thing on the inside. Okay, so I have got the cover off and now this is kind of a pain in the ass situation here because um, now this card's easy enough to remove to show you the motherboard, but on this side, you actually can't remove any of these cards uh, without removing the power supply because you can't really, the screws are there and there's no way to unscrew them unless we take out the power supply. So that's really annoying um, to take out anything on this side, you have to take out the power supply. but. Actually, these are pretty, the, like the video card that's built in is over here, and this is the hard drive control stuff, so, so you're probably not going to be removing things on this side anyways, so if you do add stuff like sound cards, just put them in on this side, and there's like three slots, so it's really not a big issue, but um, because I want to show you this motherboard, and especially that video that's built in, uh, I'm going to have to remove the power supply. A little bit annoying, but uh, well, let's get to it. All right, so here we go. I uh, have the power supply. It's still connected, but I moved it out of the way here. Um, here is the hard drive controller. Now, I don't know 
if this is like the stock one that came with it. It's when I got this machine, this is what was in it, controlling the hard drive. So um, there's no built-in hard drive controller. So I don't know if this is just the one they had kind of standard uh, that came with it. Um, looks like it's a WDC. Uh, so it looks kind of like it's from the right time era there. So um, there is a built-in floppy controller right here. It, it can, yes, it controls high density drives. That's why I have the 1.44 and 1 1.2. Um, there is a power connector on the riser. So now this right here is the video card. So it's not built in like you'd think it was built in like usual. It's actually like a daughter board card. Um, which is interesting and there's two screws we're going to have to remove and then see how it connects well that's not the connector but see it connects there and then I believe all along here is the other connector connector for it um, very interesting video chip set on this thing I was very surprised when I saw it um, so I'll show you that next but just little weird things like look at that power connector there like that is a standard AT power connector, um, but usually instead of like next to each other, it's they're like, well, they're still next to each other, but it's just the orientation is bizarre. It still works, it still works fine, um, but it's just <laughs> different. <laughs> so um, with that sound card out, let's take a look over here. We've got a, a built-in PC beeper speaker, a switch thing with switches to do things uh, because there's no documentation of this thing on the internet or this motherboard, I have no idea what those switches do. So probably things, you know, like maybe turn off the built-in flop, uh, or floppy controller and other various things, which I have no clue. Um, so hey, if anyone happens to know what these do, uh, let me know, please. Um, Zymos Poach 8 uh, chipset pieces things there. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here is the CPU. Or, no, it's not the CPU. Here is the CPU, and it is soldered on. Um, so what we have here is the Intel 386SX running at 16 megahertz. This thing is a slug. Uh, this is a really slow CPU. Um, now I'm just going to comment uh, LGR, uh, Lazy Game Reviews. He had, did a uh, review on just 386 in general. His 386 that he reviewed had the same chip. It was a 386SX, 16 megahertz. And um, it's cool because it, it's, it's so slow that it's really good for running older games that you know you need a slower computer on. But I think when he did that video, he kind of called it like a souped up 286. Um, I kind of have to disagree and I kind of agree but mostly disagree with that statement. Um, this is, it's still a completely, it's a completely different chip uh, from a 286. Um, it's more accurate just to call it a cut down 386 than a souped up 286. Um, just because it just doesn't really have all that much in common with the 286. Um, it is a 386. The SX means it's running at on a 16 bit as opposed to 32 bit uh, bus. So a full 386 is running on a 32-bit bus. This is running on a 16-bit bus. So actually, this thing is supposedly slower than a 286 at the same clock speed. So if you have a 286 running at 16 megahertz, uh, by all accounts, it is faster. Now, I don't have a 16 megahertz 286, uh, so I can't, I, I would love to kind of check that um, and test it out. Uh, I will tell you my 20 megahertz 286 is definitely faster than this thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's supposedly 286 is faster. I've seen some things say 5 to 10% faster. So yeah, this thing is a slug. Um, why would you want one of these then? Well, it did have a couple advantages. It could address more RAM, and also it could run applications that needed a 386 code that just a 286 just could never run. Um, so it was kind of like you have a 286 that's a little faster, or you get a 386SX16 that's a little slower, but it could run games and programs that a 286 just can't run. Um, so uh, this is a 387. This is a math coprocessor. Um, this did not come with the machine. I hate empty sockets, so 
I bought one of these and added it. Uh, it really adds almost nothing to this machine since I don't do CAD work. <laughs> so uh, there are a couple games of I said in the past that do take advantage of this, but like probably like the 90 percentile of games do not. It's you really don't need this, but I just I can't stand the empty sockets. So um, so yeah, that's that's the 386 SX. Uh, just a slow chip. Um, the RAM on this thing's a little bit weird, and I've had a little bit of trouble with it. Now, you probably can't notice, this is actually a daughter board. Um, underneath there is, I believe it's two megabytes of RAM soldered onto the motherboard, and right here I have, uh, these are one megabyte sticks, so I have an additional two for four megabytes of RAM. Now, the weird thing is, I have not been able to get this machine to accept more than four megabytes of RAM. Um, I have tried various combinations, uh, different RAM, different RAM sizes, different placings, everything. Uh, I cannot get this machine to recognize four megabytes, or more than four megabytes. It either won't post at all, or it will just see four megabytes. So um, I, I would assume that the max that RAM this could take is 16 megabytes uh, or more, uh, but I would think at least 16. But I have been unable to get this thing to see more than four megabytes of RAM. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, yeah, there's a screw right here. If you, I don't really feel like it, but because it's, it, look on the blog if you want to see the, the soldered on RAM under here because I took pictures of it. But you just kind of unscrew this and then you just kind of pull it off and there's like pins you can put on it. So there's that. So um, with all that out of the way, we are going to take a look at this video card, which personally I think is the most interesting part of this machine. Alright, so the card's removed. Um, you can see here where it, it uh, kind of connects here and here. Um, when you're doing this, if you have this computer by chance, don't forget the screw here like I did and take you forever to figure it out. Like why won't the damn thing come out? Um, so uh, more chips here and there. There's also weird things like uh, like this, which is the power uh, just disconnected to the floppy drive. The power is on the motherboard. It doesn't come from the power supply. It, it The power supply goes into the motherboard and then it comes out here and then into the floppy drive. Just It works, um, but it's weird. I, I don't know why they did that. Uh, but uh, let's take a look at the video card. So here we go. Uh, now for the big reveal. Ta-da! Um, so what the heck were we looking at here? Um, look at that. Isn't that weird? The connector. It's like connector built on a connector because it wasn't long enough. It's just weird. Um, but anyways, what are we looking at here? This is the fabled Cirrus Logic Eagle 2 chipset. Um, Discrete cards, like ISA cards that use this chipset, tend to go for a lot on eBay, like a hundred plus. Um, so why? What is this thing's claim to fame? Well, uh, there's not a lot of information on this thing, uh, but what I could glean from posts, say, Vogans and places like that, that this is the most CGA compatible VGA graphics chipset that exists. Um, so what does that mean? Um, now, as we all know, VGA, it's EGA is backwards compatible with CGA, and VGA is backwards compatible with EGA, and hence backwards compatible with CGA. Um, now, the thing is, whereas VGA is pretty much almost 100% compatible with EGA, and please, if anyone knows of any EGA game that does not display right on a VGA card, let me know, because I cannot find one, although there are some people that claim that there are games or programs that do not, that are EGA only and don't display right on a VGA. If you know of one, please let me know, um, just because I want to know. Um, but CGA is a different matter. Now, for the most part, it seems like VGA cards will display uh, CGA stuff just fine, but uh, some cards are better than others. Um, I don't know the technical details of it, but I do know there's something called register compatible with CGA. How it was implemented early on, it works a little bit different. Um, so if, sometimes CGA will use kind of funky graphics modes, and uh, sometimes the VGA cannot quite, most VGA cards can't quite get that right. Um, but apparently, by my understanding, 
this card is supposedly 100% compatible. Um, now there are a lot of cards that claim to be 100% register CGA compatible, such as the ATI VGA Wonders, but uh, testing has shown that they aren't quite 100%. Um, so this one is supposedly 100%. I have not had problems with this card. Um, I'm actually going to do some testing uh, later in this video that you guys can see. Um, but yeah, it's, it's supposedly. Now I've actually never ran into a VGA card that had problems with CGA, but that's probably because I do most of my CGA gaming on an actual CGA card, uh, so that might explain that. Um, okay, and if anyone knows any CGA games that don't really display correctly with uh, VGA cards, let me know. Uh, I would like to know that. Um, so yeah, I would also like to point out that um, a lot of the ISA versions of this have a uh, second connector here with, I think it's like an eight, a nine pin to connect to uh, CGA monitors, uh, so that could help compatibility. Also, a lot of times these things came with like programs or TSRs you'd run uh, to put it into like CGA mode. I don't have that for this chipset, so that could also affect its compatibility, um, seeing that you have to run it on a VGA monitor, and I don't have that program. Um, so, but yeah, this is supposedly this is a pretty uncommon chipset from my understanding. So I was, I was pretty surprised. Um, you, usually, you can tell because it actually has two, two chips. Uh, most VGA cards, you know, they'll just be one, but there's like two chips and just stuff. Um, I'm not sure. I think this is 256k v like video memory. I'm not 100%. I don't remember the moment. Check the blog. I'm sure it's there. Um, so yeah, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this thing back together, well, mostly. Um, actually, I'll just tell you right now what I'm going to do. Um, uh, and since it's open and stuff, there's the motherboard information uh, for you guys if you'd like to try to find this, like, information on this motherboard, because I would love more information on this motherboard, so. Uh, Alright, so what am I going to do? I think I'm going to install this guy uh, from my last video, or two videos ago. Um, yeah, so this is the combo drive, and this is the perfect candidate because it only has those two bays. Um, so this way I can get my, my 1.2 megabyte floppy drive plus my 1.44 megabyte drive floppy drive and a CD-ROM drive. Now, it might look funny. I think it might screw up the aesthetics a little bit, but I think this machine could really benefit from having a CD drive. Um, just because it's a 386, even though it's a super sluggish, slow 386, there's there's a lot of games that that came on, you know, especially like when your VGA games. A lot of games were re-released on CD. It's just CD versions. It's just easier to deal with um, than dead floppies and whatnot. So um, I do like to put CD drives in. Now I got a little bit of flack when I did my 286 video because it had a CD drive. It was like, well, it's not really error correct. Uh, Kind of yes, kind of no. Um, I'm pretty sure there were probably a lot of 286 machines in the early 90s that, that people held on to and they just upgraded them with CD-ROM drives. Now, I don't know if there was any 286s that came stock from the factory with CD-ROM drives, but I'm willing to bet in the early 90s, which is still sort of error correct, a lot of those faster 286s, the 16 megahertz and the 20 megahertz, did have CD-ROM drives installed. Um, so kinda. Uh, plus it's just too damn convenient. There's so many old EGA games and later that were really released on CD, so it just makes it so convenient to add a CD drive. Um, I, I mean, I would say put a CD drive in whatever. I mean, pretty much anything but an 8088, because there's really no reason to install them in an 8088, in my opinion. But yeah, 286, yeah, throw one in there. 386, heck yeah. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to try to install this. It should be very straightforward, putting it in, connecting it, CD drivers. For some weird reason, I get the feeling it will not be easy. Like, something dumb is going to happen. Like, it, it, like, the drivers won't work. It won't recognize this drive, the drivers I usually use. Or it's going to do something dumb. Like, like the, the... I just know it. Like, the hard drive won't spin up if there's a second device on the... On the Thing. It's I don't know. We'll see. Um, here's hoping it works. So, but yeah, this is what we're gonna do now. So, let's see. Ah, yeah, brand new. Probably never been used. Uh, nice. Let's just hope it works. 
So here's something sort of interesting. Um, this isn't, doesn't, it, it just says it's an AT, uh, you know, IDE drive, but it's a little bit different. Uh, focus! God, I hate this thing. Um, see? There isn't like a master slave uh, setting there with the jumpers. According to the manual here, it, it uses something called a strap switch matrix. Um, and it has drive IDs, kind of like SCSI um, of 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I'm not sure how that's going to play into stuff. Maybe I should just start out putting it on 1. Um, maybe that's kind of like being a slave drive, maybe? Um, I don't know. I guess we'll see. I've never encountered that before with the IDE drive thing. So, I mean, worst case, I could always install this as well and then uh, just put it on a separate cable and not have a master slave sort of setup. So, uh, let's see. So, I already ran into two annoyances. Um, first off is the IDE cable that I was using is the type with the Again, it really won't focus. The type with the the one of the pins that are kind of like blocked off, and this CD drive doesn't have that pin missing. So I would have either had to t rip off that pin or drill a hole in here, and I've done that before, but uh, I didn't don't have the energy to do either of those. So screw it. So that's easy enough fix. Uh, I've got a different cable that uh, didn't have that hole plugged. Um, second thing is, uh, there's no, not another extra Molex connector. Thankfully, I have a splitter. So, uh, two minor inconveniences that I was able to overcome, but, uh, oh God, I hope that's not a harbinger of things to come. Uh, so, let's carry on with the install. As I suspected, tomfoolery is afoot. Um, <laughs> When I have it connected, it powers on, but there's no post. Um, now, I have tested this by unplugging the IDE, and it boots right up. Um, so, uh, that's annoying. Um, yes, I have checked the orientation. Um, the other way, it won't even, it powers on, but like it, it doesn't do, the hard drive doesn't even spin up. Um, so, this way, it's the correct orientation here, but. Um, it just doesn't post. Uh, so um, I'll play with those jumpers on the back and see if that helps. If not, I'll just try uh, installing that uh, other controller card and hope it plays nice with this one. Okay, so changing the jumper from 0 to 1 uh, produces sort of a result. Um, before this light was on, like steady, um, now it actually turns off and the drive actually will open and close. Um, but there's no video. It won't, it's just stopped outputting video now. So, and there's a weird shrill sound coming from it too. This is all very disconcerting. I, I don't like this. Um, I did not want this to be the rest of my afternoon, but it's like once I start, I can't stop. Uh, so, I'm gonna try to figure this out. Uh, I will return. Guys, stop fighting. Okay, so uh, ID position zero uh, and two result in a no post, uh, no video, and a solid green light, and it won't open and close. Uh, positions, or wait, was zero, yeah, zero and two. One and three result in no video, it still won't post, but the solid light's out and it will actually open and close. So um, I'm going to just try installing that other uh, controller card and we'll run just, I'll just run two uh, IDE controller cards and hope they get along. Hope that works. Okay. Um, so here I have the other card installed and it seems to be working so far. Um, I've got to my it booted up to the hard drive, so um, the weird thing is when it does the floppy seek, um, like the light turns on for this one for the floppy seek, but the light doesn't come on this one, but it does make the sound, the eh sound, so um, I did open the stuff, I feel kind of bad, I completely opened, it was all sealed, so I'm just I'm just going to try the stock uh, drivers, uh, drivers on this, so now we'll see, whoops, that wasn't even 
<laughs> it wasn't even the drive. There we go. Um, so now I'm going to see if it uh, works. Now it's set up as the B drive. Uh, so, um, oh, it looks like it's working. Cool. Um, sorry. Uh, let's see. Okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, so now I'm going to install these drivers, and then we'll see if the CD drive works, and then I can put it all back together, and, uh, yeah, that'll be nice. Um, so a couple little speed bumps, but, uh, it looks like this might work out. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Um, CD-ROM driver not found, even though I installed it from the official, uh, floppy disk and just followed standard procedures and yes I did set the device uh, the jumper back to default zero on the drive but it is not finding it now uh, so I don't know I'll try maybe different drivers um, I don't know why it's not seeing it but um, Whatever. Uh, uh, well, I'll try some different drivers. Okay, so I installed my generic GS CD ROM drivers. So we'll see if that helps at all um, in a second here. Okay. I don't know what to do if these don't. Oh, whoops. I still had the driver CD in there. There we go common mistake. Happens all the time. Let's see. Uh, it takes a minute to post. Or, well, boot up, but it's an old drive. So there's no drive found. Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I knew something like this would happen. I don't know why it's not seeing it. Um, this, these drivers have been very, um, oh, what's the word, They're very reliable. Um, pr pretty much like 95% of the time these drivers will find the CD drive and, and work just fine. Um, it's not seeing the drive, huh. Um, damn. Okay, well, I'll try some other things. Back to troubleshooting, I guess. All right, uh, yeah, like a, a 10 minute, 30 minute project is we'll probably going on two hours now. Um, I don't know, I've tried, my, my best guess is that the interface card now is conflicting with this card, some resource, the address or something. Um, so, I mean, I've tried uninstalling the sound card. Um, I, I've tried a couple different things, messing around with the drivers. Um, the weird thing too is, um, the jumpers right here to set the address for this card um, this, the jumper layout in this manual is different uh, for the card there's like a switch a switch uh, with a lot more than three jumper areas so I, I don't even know even though I have all the documentation I don't even know how to set this card um, so what I'm gonna do uh, my next plan is I'm gonna just remove both of these and I'm gonna put in a IO card that I know works with um, CD drives and hard drives and I'm gonna go back to seeing if I can get both of these on the same um, you know as like a slave master sort of configuration with just just getting rid of both of these and just bringing in a different uh, IO controller with an IDE controller we'll see alright success um, I tried using another card and putting them both on as sort of a master slave thing and and spill my focus. Um these uh these gold whoop, that was weird, it just like jumped out of my hands. Um these gold star ones are usually pretty reliable. Anyways, I had the same problem, it just wouldn't even post. Um so then I went back and when you install with the drivers, you get an option of your interface, and I was picking you know, the interface card that came with it, which obviously is having some sort of problem. 
So as my workaround, I chose to use the Sound Blaster as an interface. Um, which seems to have worked because it sees it now. Um, so now just to see if it works by putting a CD in. So uh, I'll put in a CD and then we'll see if it works. If it reads the CD then I, I can put it back together and it looks like it was a su success. Blah, success. Alright well uh, it does appear to be playing a music CD, so, um, let me see, I think it's very, the volume's very low. <laughs> it's like, it's turned up all the way, too. So the volume, maybe there's a volume control in this player. Um, so it's reading a CD, uh, it's reading a music CD, it's probably going to read a game. So it looks like we have success. So I'm going to install a couple games, put this thing back together, and I think the plan now is to just show you guys some captured footage of a couple games running on it, and uh, some CGA games, and some you know VGA games from the time. And um, I have a program, it's, it's, this, it, anyways, I have a CGA tester program that we're going to run and uh, it put the card through its paces to see how CGA compatible it is. So that's coming up right now. So it is indeed installing games from the CD. So it looks like we're good. Um, in case you're wondering while this opened, this is a, this is a pretty old hard drive. This is actually the hard drive that came installed with it. Uh, it's just like a 107 uh, megabyte Seagate hard drive. Uh, it's an ST3120A, so uh, pretty small, but I guess it's period correct for this thing. So um, let's check out that CGA tester, and then let's check out some games. Hmm. Well, I'll admit it does look a little bit weird, but uh, it works, so I guess that's all that counts. Um, yeah, that just looks weird, <laughs> but, yeah, whatever. Ugh, I mean, seriously, I started fiddling with this stupid thing at, like, 7.30, and I, I thought I'd, you know, make a quick video, stall the drive, three hours max. Well, I did shoot some game footage, so, ugh, that's that's usually how it goes with these things. Hey, uh, before we g I get into some capture footage, this is actually here my capture computer screen. Um, it's all down there. There's usually the computer I, I game on. Um, so when I started this channel, I did not want to use DOSBox. I wanted to show you guys, you know, pretty much exactly how I'm seeing it um, by doing, you know, direct capture. For a while, I was doing it through converting it to S video, but um, last year or so, uh, maybe a little bit less than a year. That computer down there, I got a couple good capture cards in there. I have a Avermedia that works really well for like Windows stuff and up. And then I have the Epipan uh, DVI to PCIe card and supposedly it's like a thousand dollar card. Um, it, but it's very user unfriendly. Now, <clears throat> if somebody out there that happens to like to make uh, very informative and detailed how-to computer stuff videos would like to do a video on how to set this thing up to capture games that would be amazing or you know anyone it would be great um, because I'm just I just cannot really get this thing to um, work how I want to I mean it captures all the VGA signals I throw at it and it definitely looks better than the S video solution but um, well, you'll see in the videos coming up, it always, I, I don't know how to tune it, so it's, it's always cutting off a little bit of the left of the screen, and um, the colors look washed out, uh, and also, it's recording it in widescreen, and then, you know, I'm converting it afterwards, um, uh, I'm converting it right now to 7, it should be 4 by 3 aspect ratio, 720 by 480, that, um, but it still doesn't look quite right. Uh, so, just saying, the, the video capture footage coming up, um, it's pr it probably won't look exactly right, but uh, that's the reason why. Uh, I really just don't have a handle on this capture card yet. But again, I don't want to do DOSBox, and uh, I still think this is, looks way better than when I was doing the S video stuff. So, 
Uh, here comes some of that capture footage. Okay, um, here's just the post because I always just like to show whatever machine I'm showing off posting, um, you know, for whatever reason. Some people might appreciate that. Um, yeah, like I said, you can tell here it's just like a little bit of the the left is kind of cut off. Like I, I just cannot really um, figure out this software. So and it also records everything in AVI format, which is huge. So and and it cuts it up. So it'll do like a gigabyte of of footage, which in AVI it will go through gigabytes like that. Um, and then I have to use another program and convert it to MP4, and it's just it's a pain. And yes, I've tried other programs to record it in something like MP4, just straight out so I don't have to do the conversion and nothing seems to work right um, it just it, so I, that's just what I've been doing um, so there we go it loaded up now finally got all the drivers working there's the memory and stuff I didn't run MemMaker yet um, that was a problem I ran into this machine a lot it was a lot of memory problems I, I tried a couple games like Rise of the Triad and stuff like that it should run on it but it just it's that four megabytes of memory. Um, so this is that CGA compatibility tester. Um, <laughs> I'll just tell you right now, this thing failed miserably. Um, yeah, it just didn't work. It, it, like none of the tests really worked. Uh, but you know what? I, I don't think it's because that. It, I don't think it's the chipset's fault. I think it's just because. I mean, I don't know a whole lot of the technical side of this stuff. Um, but I think it's because like it has to really be running on a CGA monitor, and like I said, sometimes these uh, cards, like I know my ATI VGA Wonder Plus, uh, with its driver disc, it also came with a little program that like you could put it into like a, a CGA compatible mode, um, and I didn't have that. This is just straight from the card VGA, um, and it just it failed all these tests. But I don't I don't think it's really the card's fault because like I said, the discrete uh, ISA versions of this chipset. Uh, it has the the two pin thing, so you can hook it up to a CGA monitor, which I think might be necessary to get kind of like the hundred percent compatibility. So I can't really fault it um, doing this test. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind because the games I'm going to show, I, I played a couple CGA games. I, I don't have all the time in the world, um, but the C couple CGA games I did play on it, it, it played fine. If anyone has a suggestion for a CGA game that's known to give problems with a VGA card, uh, let me know and maybe I'll revisit this and test them, but um, I don't want to go through all these tests here. I'll just show you a couple more quickies. So here's just a couple other quick tests. This shows like the characters, like thick and thin. It looked okay here. Um, yeah, so that was, I don't know, it's a little interesting test. I think this is like testing the intensities. Um, with the CGA, it kind of worked out it, here fine. I was able to see everything. You're able to see them all, obviously. Um, okay, there was a lot more, but like I said, it, most of them it failed miserably, but we already talked about that. So here's it's a really quick, um, this one here, forgot the name of it for some reason, uh, <laughs> but uh, here we go. And yeah, it's, it's abysmably, abysmably slow. It's 3D Bench. Um, and just to I don't want you to go through this whole thing, I don't think. Um, but anyways, it scored a 4.4, uh, whereas my 20 MHz 286 scored um, 6.3. But to be fair, it used they had different graphics cards, so I guess that's not completely fair. Um, Top Bench, though, gave this machine a 27, whereas my 20 MHz 286, it gave a 42. So, um, yeah, it's just it's not a very fast CPU. So now we're going to look at Wolfenstein 3D. Uh, but you're going to notice something in a minute that it's all messed up. <laughs> but I do not think that is the fault of the graphics card because I ran this benchmark in another computer and it, this was like one of my first times using this, the Wolf 3D one, and, and it had the same exact graphical glitches. Um, so I think that's my bad when I uh, transferred over the Wolf 3D files um, to the benchmark program, I, I think one or two of those must be corrupted. Um, but it, it, it's not the chipset's fault. I'm, I'm almost positive. Um, but it still kind of gives an idea of how it would play. Um, sorta. <laughs> Just pretend the glitches aren't there. So, okay, so let's move on to uh, another game, which is Striker. Oh, and there's no sound because uh, these were using PC speaker, and I didn't really set it up to capture the PC speaker, so. Uh, I guess it probably helps that I'm talking rather than just like silence. 
Um, so this is Striker. This is a notoriously speed sensitive game. Uh, it really needs a, a 4.77 MHz 8088 or something very close to that. Um, yeah, you'll see it still runs fast on this, but it, it actually almost is playable, which is kind of a testament to how slow this CPU is. <laughs> so, um, and in a second here, I'll, I actually hit the turbo button, which slows it down, and it becomes even a little bit more playable. Um, but still not really optimal. It, it's still running too fast. It's like obviously running too fast, uh, even with the turbo button. But yes, it's this. it almost looks playable here, but it's really not. It's still running a little bit too fast, just a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's it's just it's a slow CPU. Usually this game, it's just it just runs fast on everything but the slowest computers. Okay, and that's a CGA game too. So um, next we're going to take a look at Wheel of Fortune. Um, this is CGA. Also, it uses a different color palette here. I really can't make up my mind which color palette's uglier. Uh, uh it's such a hard decision. They're both so hideous. I want to say the other one, that magenta green is uglier, but... Yeah, I mean, maybe that magenta green teal or whatever that is is a little bit uglier than this color palette, but it's still ugly. It's really ugly. Um, yeah, this is just Wheel of Fortune. Um, old version of Wheel of Fortune on a CGA. Spin the wheel for the treasure to take. <laughs> Anyways, um, all right, let's move on to the next game, which is Pit Stop or Pit Stop 2. I think it's Pit Stop, uh, which is also a CGA game. Okay, so this is the CGA game Pit Stop, which seems to run pretty much fine on this machine. Um, Although I never played this game on a any other, I, I've never played this game before, so I've never played it on a slower or faster computer, so I can't really, I don't really know what the exact correct speed should look like. Uh, but it seemed to play just fine. Um, it's a pretty simple game. Um, if anything, it would be running a little bit fast, uh, but it didn't really seem like it was running all that fast. But then again, I can't, don't really have anything to compare it to. Um, Guess I could have went and played it on an 8088 or something, but anyways, okay, let's let's move on to something uh, not CGA. Uh, I hope that didn't come over the mic like real screechy and annoying um but yeah again i didn't have it hooked up to record pc speaker but believe me there's music going on it's just not being recorded at the moment um so yeah this is leisure suit larry and it works fine <laughs> i didn't really expect it not to um so this would be kind of like the kind of games you could play on this machine um sort of earlier EGA and CGA games that aren't super speed sensitive, um, even some VGA stuff, but uh, really nothing too intense or this thing bogs down. And I have one example of that I show later. Like I said, I really wanted to do some more intensive VGA games on this, but a lot of my games are boxed up and I was too lazy to pull them out. And the stuff I did try kept giving me not enough memory uh, issues. So it's because of that four megabytes I can't seem to get past of RAM. All right, so here's our next game, which is uh, Biomenace, and I actually have sound for this, so. Uh, anyway, yeah, this is Biomenace. This is a good example, too, of what this capture card is doing, um, because the colors here look washed out, and they do not, when I, you know, on my, I'm splitting the VGA signal, and the one's going to my CRT, and it looks fine there. Um, but when it's captured, it kind of looks washed out, especially like these reds. Um, but this game actually didn't scroll all that smoothly. Um, so it's, it's an SVGA mode. It looks like EGA, uh, but apparently it's SVGA. Uh, but yeah, it just it, it was completely playable, as you can see. Very playable, but it's a little it's a bit of stuttering in the scrolling. You can really kind of tell here. 
um, but if it didn't come across with the video capture, take my word for it, it, it didn't feel like it was really scrolling all that smoothly. Okay, now we have a little game called Night Raid, which is an update remake of Paratrooper. Um, I think it's Paratrooper or Paratroopers, but this is pretty much the exact same concept. The little paratrooper guys are coming down to blow up your little fort thing, and you've got to shoot them and shoot the planes uh, down. So I believe the original was like a CGA game, very much at home on like an IBM 5150. Um, and this game is just sort of a clone or a remake or something. Um, and it runs, it's in VGA, and it runs acceptable. Um, maybe it feels slightly, very slightly slow, but not really. It runs, it seems to run just, it's playable, it's playable. Like I said, it, may, it feels maybe slightly slow, but it's quite playable. Alright, so here's the game Cannon Fodder, uh, another VGA game, and here you can tell there's a bit more slowdown. Um, I'm actually going to edit this a little bit because it just takes a really long time to um, load in between these scenes. Um, but yeah, you can really tell there's some slowdown, especially coming up here, like here, right here. Uh, yeah, not really smooth uh, at all. So this, this is where the games start taking their toll on that. Uh, 16 megahertz SX 386 processor. Okay, so here we are. Now, once you get into the game, it still is playable, at least this first level. Um, later on, if more things are going on, obviously it could really become bogged down, but um, it's it's playable, at least at the beginning part. Um, again, it, it might not all be the processor. It might not be the fastest uh, VGA card, that Eagle 2 chipset. I don't know. I haven't really extensively tested it. Um, but it doesn't seem like it would be any slower than anything else up at this time. So, okay, let's move on to the last game, Major Striker. <laughs> Okay, so this is Major Striker, a cool Apogee sort of, uh, what a vertical shooter or shmup, if you like to call them. I know a lot of people have a problem with the word genre like shmup. Um, yeah, it sounds stupid, but I don't have a problem with it. Whatever, it's a shmup. Um, it's a pretty cool game. It seems a little bit kind of like anime influence, a little bit. Um, it looks like EGA, but I believe it's running in like a VGA mode, like 256 VGA. Um, and it runs fine on this machine. Um, I think this machine is going to be running most EGA and EGA-ish, like non-demanding VGA stuff pretty well. Um, but I, like I said, I, I, I guess I could have been more thorough and played this game on a couple systems to get a feel for what the correct speed maybe is. Um, I guess I should have tested this game maybe on a faster computer first. Um, just to see, but it it's it's playable. I mean, I, don't, I can't really tell if it's it, maybe it's running a little bit slow. Um, I don't really know if this is supposed to be like a fast-paced game. Um, but I mean, well, you're you're seeing right here. If you're if you've played this game on a different like a faster computer and you know what the correct speed is supposed to be and what this game's supposed to look like, um, put it in the comments. But this being my first time playing this game and playing it on this uh, 16 megahertz 386 SX processor, it, it seems to be running decently, maybe a little bit slow. Um, there are some scrolling issues, which is probably the fault of the graphics card. You can see there's some like weird blinking over to the left every once in a while, but nothing breaks the game. The game is still quite playable. Um, yeah, Major Striker. Um, so anyways, yeah, uh, that basically is the BSR 3D6 
uh, SX16. Um, so if you have any comments or questions or anything, put them in the comments. Um, check out the blog. I have a lot more information there. I break down, take different pictures of it, and talk about it if you prefer written other than videos. Of course, if you're at this point, you pretty much watched the video. Um, but yeah, that's that's it's kind of a weird weird computer. It's not quite um, you know. I mean, it is a standard PC compatible machine, IBM PC compatible. It's, it's just a little bit, little bit different. So, all right, thanks a lot. Uh, if you like the video, subscribe and all that jazz. And uh, thank you guys again. And uh, got more stuff coming. So, thank you all.